Do you know how hard it is to keep you alive? Our universe, as we understand it, is an infinite expanse of mostly empty space coursing with cosmic rays that would kill you within 15 seconds. And in that infinite expanse, out of billions of galaxies, there's one galaxy with one nondescript star with dozens of celestial bodies around it, only one of which has a large stabilizing moon and a magnetic field protecting it from the cosmic rays, just far enough away from the star for liquid water to form. Liquid water that will kill you. You can't live on it, you can't drink 96.5% of it, it's uninhabitable and toxic to humans. And there's a lot of it. 71% of the Earth's surface is water, so much that we have an actual water hemisphere. Literally one half of our planet is almost totally covered in water. If an alien approached the Earth from this angle, they'd think that we didn't have any land at all. But even on the 29% of the planet that we can live on, there are huge swaths of it that are just, let's just say, not very comfortable. So we have this tiny fraction of the planet that we can live on, but even then, all we can do is live on this sliver along the surface. If we go up only five miles, we'll die from lack of oxygen. If we dig down only three miles, we'll die from extreme temperatures or get crushed by ocean pressure. The entire human race exists in this one eight mile zone. And for hundreds of thousands of years, we thought that's all there was. Today, we mathematically understand that there must be somewhere out there another planet like ours. And so far, we found 3,400 exoplanets. Just another 10 billion to go. Josh Treffenstedt asks, can you do a video about exoplanets? Up until 1995, exoplanets were just kind of a theoretical thing. But all that changed with the discovery of the first exoplanet, 51 Pegasi b, or 51 Peg for short. Now there were a couple of planets that were discovered earlier in 1992, but they orbited around a pulsar, so that didn't really count, and they were still trying to figure out for sure whether or not they were legit or not. But 51 Pegasi is a sun-like star, so it definitely counted. What it didn't do was make any sense at all. It came to be known as a hot Jupiter, meaning it was a Jupiter-sized planet that orbited extremely close to the star. So close that it orbited the star every four days. You would not want to go to there. The thinking at the time was that it was impossible for a planet that size to form that close to the star. But since then, they've actually found a lot of hot Jupiters, and scientists now believe that they do form out in the solar system just like Jupiter did, but then move inward over time. In fact, it's now hypothesized that the only reason Jupiter didn't have the same fate was because of the gravitational effects of Saturn and the outer gas giants. Of course, if Jupiter had moved in the way those hot Jupiters did, it would have eventually either crashed into Earth or flung us out of the solar system. But instead, it stayed in this nice little place out there, basically becoming the solar system's vacuum cleaner, eating up all the comets and asteroids that could have possibly hit us. Man, we got lucky. We just found one planet and already we gained a whole new understanding of our own solar system. That's how you science people. 51 Peg B was discovered by a technique called radial velocity. As many of you know, when a planet orbits a star, the planet's gravity affects the star's position ever so slightly. Same is true with the Earth and the Moon. So when viewed from above the planetary plane, it looks like the star has a tiny wobble. This is radial velocity. But even if you're viewing the orbital plane more heads-on, you can still see radial velocity by measuring the differences in the star's wavelengths. Thanks to the Doppler effect, when the star wobbles away from you, the light's slightly red-shifted. When it wobbles towards you, it's slightly blue-shifted. The rate and characteristics of the wobble can tell us a lot about the planet's size and density, and perturbations in the wobble indicate the presence of multiple planets. According to NASA, at the time of recording this, 639 planets have been found using the radial velocity method. The thing is, this method is mostly successful for finding big Jupiter-sized planets, because the planet has to be that big in order for its gravity to affect the star enough to be detectable. If we want to find other planets like Earth, we've got to try something different. So in 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched with the specific purpose of finding transits. Transits occur when the orbital plane of a star just happens to line up edge-on with our perspective, and one of the planets passes in front of the star. This dims the brightness of the star very slightly, but by measuring the duration of the transit and the amount the light dims, you can learn a lot about the planet's size, density, and distance from the star. And through astrospectroscopy, we can tell whether the planet has an atmosphere and even the composition of elements in the atmosphere by how the light interacts with that atmosphere as it passes through. And that can give us an idea of what the conditions on the planet are like. This is the upside of transit photometry. It gives us a much better picture of what these planets are like, and it makes it possible for us to find small rocky planets more like Earth. Here on Earth, we witness transits of Venus and Mercury, which are actually surprising surprisingly rare. The next Venus transit isn't going to be till 2117. I wish I had known it was such a big deal when it happened back in 2012. I would have gotten a lot more drunk. This is the downside of the transit method. 
because the vast majority of orbital planes aren't likely to line up just perfectly so that we can view them in this way. But even still, the Kepler Space Telescope has been able to confirm the discoveries of 2,335 exoplanets, 30 of which are roughly twice the size of Earth, small, rocky, and in the habitable zones of their stars. And that's just with Kepler. In total, 2,732 planets have been found using the transit method. And here comes the mind blow. Considering how rare transits are and extrapolating out from that data, scientists now believe that there's an average of 1.6 planets per star in the Milky Way galaxy. At 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, that comes out to 640 billion planets, 10 billion of which are expected to be Earth-like. Now, for the sake of thoroughness, there are a few other methods that scientists have used to find exoplanets, and one of them is called gravitational microlensing. A gravitational lens is a relativistic effect where the gravity of an object in the foreground bends the light of a distant star behind it. We mostly use this with galaxy clusters, but it can also be used to discover planets. We've discovered 47 planets this way so far. Another, called astrometry, is similar to radial velocity effect, but the wobble is in relation to other stars. So far, only one planet's been found this way. And just in case you notice, all of these methods are actually indirect. You're not seeing the planet itself, you're seeing that planet's effect on the star or the star's light. So you might be wondering, why can't we just take a picture of a planet? Well, we have. Direct imaging a planet is very difficult because the star is so bright that it's hard to discern the planet from the star, especially at the distance that we're dealing with. But there are ways to put a proverbial thumb over the star so we can detect the light bouncing off the planet, or the thermal signature of the heat that the planet's absorbing from the star. And we found 43 planets this way so far. We've actually taken pictures of 43 planets outside of our solar system. The diversity of planets we've found so far is mind-blowing, from hot Jupiters to hot Neptunes to puffy planets, which are a lot like Jupiter but far less dense. Planets like JG 1214b, which are thought to be water worlds completely surrounded by ocean, to a planet we discovered in 2011 that we think might actually be made out of diamond. Even rogue planets floating around throughout the galaxy and not attached to any solar system, probably flung out by those hot Jupiters as they were making their way into the solar system. But of course what we're really interested in is other planets like Earth. And for that, scientists have come up with something called the Earth Similarity Index, or the ESI. And it looks like this. There's a link in the description if you want to figure that mess out. But it measures planets from 0 to 1, with 1 being completely similar to Earth. And one of the most promising that we've found so far is Kepler 438b. It's 12% bigger than Earth, gets 40% more light, and it's a rocky planet in the habitable zone. The only thing is its star is a very active dwarf star that throws off massive solar flares. So unless it has a strong magnetic field like we do, it's probably not suitable for life. Kepler 442b is only 1.3 times the size of Earth. It orbits its star every 112 days and has an average temperature of around negative 40 degrees Celsius. Now that's cold, but it's actually colder on Mars, so this planet is more likely to have life than Mars does. Then there's Gliese 667c, which was discovered in 2012. It's actually quite a bit bigger than Earth, but it has an average temperature of around 5 degrees Celsius, which is plenty warm enough for liquid water to form. But the most recent discovery that's captured our imagination is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which you've probably heard about it. It was first discovered by the TRAPPIST telescope in Chile and then later studied by the Spitzer and Hubble space telescopes. But this system has seven rocky planets in it. Seven. And as many as three of these planets, TRAPPIST-1, D, E, and F, all fall in the star's habitable zone. And it's a tiny star system, really closer in size to Jupiter and its moons. And what's so cool about it is if you were standing on one of those planets, you would be able to see all the other planets as big as the moon in the sky. And you could travel between the planets in just a matter of days. Unfortunately, being so close to their star means that these planets are likely tidally locked, meaning one side faces the planet at all times, like the moon does with us. Which kind of puts a damper on things because that makes it very unlikely for life to form. But still, if we were to go there, it might be kind of comfortable for us. And it's also still just an amazing discovery to find that many Earth-like planets in one star system. Now, there are new discoveries happening all the time, and there's far too many to mention in one video already, so if you're watching this in the future, which you are, and there's one of the planets that I didn't mention that you want to give a call out, talk about it in the comments. This, by the way, is just the beginning. With new projects like the James Webb Space Telescope coming up in the next few years, we are going to make discoveries that are going to absolutely explode our understanding of planets in our galaxy. The universe is a harsh, cold, empty place that is not kind to life, but somehow, this little planet, Earth, created a nice little sanctuary that made our existence possible. It was incredibly unlikely, but the fact that it happened once means that maybe it happened again. And if we're lucky, we might find another sanctuary soon.
All right, guys, thanks for watching. Please like and share to help spread this video around. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. You might like it. I talk about a lot of similar topics. And if you do like them, uh, maybe subscribe. I do this every Monday. Big thanks as always to the Answer Files on Patreon. I want to take a second and call out the new people who have joined the, uh, the crew this week. We have uh, Stephen Hughes, Andre Wetzel, Tom Cummings, and Rob Hyodo actually uh, upped his pledge a little bit, and I want to thank him for that. If you'd like to join them and get special perks, like being able to see my secret vlog that's only for Patreon viewers, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. And as always, this video is sponsored by Cankerboy.com. If you get regular canker sores and mouth ulcers, you need to fix your mouth. Cankerboy is a daily supplement that keeps those bad boys from happening. You can do a risk-free trial at cankerboy.com. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.